Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner. We're covering section 1.6 of an introduction to thermal physics by Daniel V. Schroeder. And 1.6 goes over heat capacities. So the heat capacity is defined as the amount of heat that is needed to raise the temperature of some object or system. So, and that's given per degree of temperature. So this that defined to be Q over the change in temperature of that object. Of course, if the object is larger, there's more mass to it, it's gonna take more heat to raise its temperature. So we often refer to the specific heat capacity, which is lowercase c, which is defined to be the big uppercase C over the mass M, which we can think of as Q over M and the delta T. This definition is ambiguous because it's not clear what it means to raise the temperature. What happens to the other parameters that can change when you add heat to a system? So if we do a little bit of algebra, we can see the problem with this definition. So this should be equal to Q, which is the change in the internal energy minus the work done on the system over the change in temperature. And so the heat capacity would include the work that may be done by the system as it changes. One choice we can have for work is we can set that to zero because we refuse to allow the volume to change and so no work is done by the system or on the system. So we would demote this as the heat capacity at constant volume and define that to be the change in the internal energy over the change in its temperature. And we're gonna use this subscript V to indicate that the volume isn't changing. And we can actually use a partial differential equation here, partial differential here. So du by dt with the constant v. Now, if you aren't familiar with this particular notation, if you haven't studied multivariable calculus, that's okay. There's a problem here that kind of gives you a story of why this notation is important. What you need to understand, or what I understand when I see this, is this is almost the same as du by dt, except that u is not just a function of t. There's also other parameters that may cause u to vary. And so we can't use the d's. We have to use the curly d's, uh, du by dt. Now, in the case of u, there are other parameters that change and the temperature it changes uh, according to how the volume changes. So we need to bolt this down and say, we're gonna keep one of these variables constant. And that'll allow us to understand which aspect of u is changing and how it's changing. Okay, so typically you won't see this notation when you see partial differentials in other parts of physics, like when you're doing multivariable calculus in electrodynamics, but this is something that's important in thermodynamics because the variables are all related to each other. He says we might call this the energy capacity. So-called because it shows how the energy changes, the internal energy changes with relation to the change in temperature. The CV of water is about equal to one calorie. Well, it's exactly equal to one calorie per degree Celsius or centigrade. And that's equal to 4.2 joules per degree centigrade. Okay, that's for water. Okay. There is another kind of heat capacity that we often look at. So we often look at the C sub P, the heat capacity at constant pressure. And so what that looks like is that's the change in the energy of the system minus the change in the work. So that'd be minus P delta V over the change of the temperature. And this is all held at constant pressure, okay? And we can rewrite that as uh, du by dt at constant pressure plus the pressure times dv by dt at constant pressure. Okay. And the reason why we like this one is because oftentimes in the laboratory, we are not able to maintain the volume. Now for a gas, it's pretty easy to maintain a constant volume. But for other substances, liquids and solids, you would require very high pressures to maintain the exact same volume. So we typically allow the volume to change as we add heat or remove heat from a system. In terms of magnitude, these two terms uh, can be quite different. So in solids and liquids, the difference between these two terms 
means that this term can often be ignored and you'll get a very correct answer, not a completely correct answer, but a very correct answer. Now, if you do the same with the gas, because the volume changes quite a bit when you add energy to a gas, if you allow the volume to change, then you would see that you would be quite off. So there are three ways that you could determine the heat capacity of some particular object. One way is to measure it. So you would actually set up system to transfer heat and you measure how much heat was transferred and then you measure the change in the system that received the heat. The other way you can do that is you can look it up in a book. And if you are in an engineering environment where you need to know the exact value, then I encourage you to go get a book, a reliable book, and these books are quite large and look up these values in the book. And the last option is you can look, try to predict it theoretically. Okay, now he says this last option is really the most fun. This is really what physics is about. What you've already learned is enough to predict the heat capacity of most objects, many objects, which is quite exciting. To understand how powerful this prediction can be and how exact you can get it. So we already have this idea that U is equal to one half in FKT for something that behaves with the equipartition theorem. Okay, and we're just dropping the static term because the static term won't change depending on how much heat we add or remove. Okay, so we can calculate the constant volume uh, heat capacity, which is going to be the change in U over the change in temperature. So, well, that's just what, one half. NFKT, 1 over 2 NFKT, and this T term is the only one that matters, right? So we're taking the D by DT of this T term, so I'll, I'll put the D by DT, so I'm sorry, curly D by DT. The end result is if you take the partial derivative of something directly, you just get the number 1, so we get NFK over 2. Okay, very simple thing to do there. This, of course, relies on F not depending on temperature. In practice, you'll see that depending on the temperature range you're at, uh, F will quite depend on the temperature. So you'll unlock degrees of freedom as the temperature rises. For this particular case, notice that the internal energy doesn't depend on the volume or the pressure, right? And so you, this is the same as this guy up here, right? So it'll give you the same answer for CV or CP. So let's take something like helium. So in helium, F is equal to three. So we expect that the constant volume heat capacity of helium should be three halves times the amount, the number of particles you have times Boltzmann's constant, which we can change that to be three halves times the number of moles times R, okay? For diatomic molecules, we expect F equals 5, but really that number could increase. So you could have more as the temperature increases. And there's a beautiful graph here. Um, I turn your attention on page 30 here to figure 113, where he shows that if you were to graph the temperature in degrees Kelvin and the heat capacity for hydrogen, this is H2, okay? you'll see that it starts off at three halves R at low temperatures. So this is, we're gonna do the gas. So it's a gas all the way down here. And then you have around 100 degrees Kelvin. Uh, it starts to rise up and it has a new plateau at five halves R2, five halves R. And then it's gonna rise up somewhere around 1000 degrees Kelvin and go up to a new level. Actually, it's gonna go up at an angle Okay, and so we account for this area here. This is due to the rotation of the hydrogen molecule. These obviously, this three halves is due to the translation, rotation, and then over here, we're gonna see that this area is due to the vibration, the different modes of vibration of the hydrogen molecule. So that's a fantastic graph. That's something that I encourage you to look at and to see how the theory matches so closely to what we actually see in real life. For solids, we're going to use F equals six. This actually has a name. It's called the rule of Dulong and Pettit. However, for solids, F will be zero 
at t equals zero. So there's going to be some curve where the solid tends towards zero as you lower the temperature. And this is for all solids. And in figure 114, he gives you another graph. And that, that's something interesting to look at to see how these different substances approach this uh, 3R, 6 halves R behavior as the temperature increases. And there's a certain sense, I, solids that tend to melt at lower temperatures seem to approach that 3R limit much quicker than ones that don't melt at low temperatures. What happens with the heat capacities of gases at constant pressure? For an ideal gas, the derivative d, du by dt is the same with p fixes as v fix. So du by dt p is going to be the same as du by dt v for ideal gases. Okay. So at constant pressure, we have to worry about the dv by dt term. And this is going to be d by dt of nkt over p. So that's the ideal gas law rewritten with v on the left side. And so that's just going to give you n k over p because we're holding p fixed. Okay. So the constant pressure heat capacity is going to be the same as the constant volume heat capacity. That's the du by dt um, holding p constant plus this n k, which is equal to the same as the constant volume heat capacity plus a number of moles times r. But this is for an ideal gas. Problem 141 is a problem where we can do some calculations. Suppose we took a chunk of metal, we heated it to the boiling point of water by leaving it in boiling water for a while. And then we put it into a styrofoam cup containing water at 20 degrees centigrade. So the question is, what do you expect to happen? And we do some calculations here. It's a fairly straightforward problem. Uh, problem 142, the specific heat capacity of, of noodles that you buy at the store. That's what Albertson's Rotini Tricolor is. Albertsons is a, is a famous chain store in the United States that sells groceries and Rotini Tricolor is probably just three colored noodles that you buy in the store, fairly cheap noodles. This is just asking what happens when you throw pasta into water. So if, if you've ever cooked pasta before, you know, notice that when the water is boiling and you throw the pasta in, it immediately stops boiling. And so what you're doing here is calculating how much heat the pasta absorbs, which should give you an idea how long it'll take the water to start boiling again. Okay. Problem 143. So in this one, what you're going to do is you're going to calculate the heat capacity per molecule in water. And the question here is how many degrees of freedom, if you assume that all the energy was stored in quadratic degrees of freedom using the equipartition theorem, how many degrees of freedom should each water molecule have? So that's a fun little problem to do. 144. At the back of the book is a table of thermodynamic data for selected substances at room temperature. Okay. And here, what I want you to do is look at the CP values in the table and check which Q can account for. So which ones approximately match what you would expect to see from a theoretical prediction standpoint based on what you already know, and which ones are weird, okay? The weird ones we will explain later in the book. You'll understand more about why those values don't match. Problem 145. Problem 145 has more to do with multivariable calculus. So if you haven't studied multivariable calculus and you're not comfortable with these curly Ds, this is a great problem to do, okay? I'm gonna try to help you understand what's going on here. So in problem 145, you have W is equal to XY and X is equal to YZ, right? So W can be rewritten as Y squared Z or it could be rewritten as, let's see, that would be uh, Y is Z over X over Z. So we have uh, X squared over Z, okay? And then when you take the two versions of this and you calculate the partial derivative, you'll see that they're not equal, right? You have to choose one of these variables to hold still in order to calculate the partial derivative, okay? And if you go through this exercise and figure out the different partial derivatives you can calculate, you kind of see why it's important that we hold one of these constants fixed. And again, this doesn't arise in electrodynamics because we don't have variables that depend on so many variables like that. So it's, it's not quite an issue in electrodynamics. So electrodynamics, the, we can just take the D by DTs and replace them with the curly Ds and everything just works out. Okay, it's not the case in thermodynamics. Problem 146. In this problem, what we're gonna do is we're gonna see what happens when you try to keep the volume constant and measure the heat capacity of solids and liquids. 
Okay. And so he walks you through like how much pressure basically you'd have to apply and um, what, what, what the experiment would have to look like in order to do that properly. Okay. We will probably continue tomorrow with a continuation of this section talking about latent heat enthalpy and some other things, some other problems there. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Have a great day. Take care and bye-bye.